Richard was a real English gentleman, if I could start there. He uh, just had a very calm demeanor, very authoritative, but in a style that was always friendly, very thoughtful. We would have strategy conversations and it would never be making a decision. It would always be, that's terrific. Let's think about that. Let's revisit that. Let's check with another couple of people. So extremely collaborative. He really enabled his team enabled them, trusted them, and and empowered them to uh, bring their expertise to the table. He was a great facilitator, and, and he was able to effectively communicate across our country chapters. And, and Richard really was respected across all those chapters and all of those cultures. So he had a way of communicating in a style uh, which uh, I think people really genuinely felt Richard was a friend. And I certainly felt that personally. I felt privileged to be an extension of his leadership team. He was always very welcoming in terms of input and ideas. Didn't always you know, agree uh, with those ideas, but that's fine. That's what the spirit of, uh, of working together is all about, to come up with the best possible uh, answer. So he was very inclusive. Um, and uh, I, I think he was a very interesting person to get to know as well. And the fact that he shared some of his personal side, it, it was a, a terrific working relationship. And, and I'm sad that it suddenly stopped. When Cambridge-based doctors Kate and Graham Petrie sent their son Richard to a summer mountain training course in Tullock, Scotland, they could not have imagined that he would be learning skills that would later not only save his and others' lives, but would also guide his approach to life. Richard, born on the 8th of January 1959, was their eldest son and brother to Andrew, Lizzie and Sarah. He attended St Faith's Prep and the Lees School in Cambridge. In sixth form, in 1976, he participated in a school field trip to Spitsbergen, the largest and only permanently populated island of Svalbard in northern Norway. While on an excursion, an intense snowstorm cut off his party from the base camp, As the wind and snow of the complete whiteout whipped around, the area became indistinguishable and the group lost their bearings. Despite the fear and adversity, Richard, just aged 17, drew upon his mountain survival training to aid the safe return of his fellow pupils and the staff to the main camp. This experience was life-changing. It gave him a set of beliefs that lasted all his life. He learnt the importance of having a sound, logical plan, being strong enough to assert leadership and to follow the plan with confidence. Richard went on to attend Trinity College, Cambridge via an engineering tripos and received an MBA at INSEAD Fontainebleau in France to establish a career in the construction industry. After a brief experience of designing transatlantic optic cabling for STC, he was hired at Trafalgar House where he negotiated a build-operate-transfer model toll road from Jakarta to Bandung. The project required him to move to Indonesia capital And with his wife, Jane, and their children, Michael, Charlotte, and Madeleine, they made it their home for four years. While at Trafalgar House, the company was bought out by Caverna, a Norwegian engineering and construction services company, which introduced new opportunities for Richard. He managed a portfolio of small construction companies, then shifted his attention to the task of preparing Finnish cruise liner shipyards for sale. He also managed BAA's now Heathrow Airport Holdings, building projects across their UK portfolio, including managing the construction of the passenger bridge that straddles the runway in Gatwick Airport. In Richard's business approach, he applied his strategy of developing a clear, logical plan, enabling his team to clearly understand it, believe in it, and follow it with confidence. This led to a chance meeting that would go on to define Richard's legacy. How can I put this? We had been dreaming about doing something like this, but didn't have an incentive to get out of our own way of volunteer work, publish a standard, do some more work, publish an upgrade to the standard, and hope somebody noticed. It's a shock to actually see that, well, somebody has noticed, and they've asked us to step up our game. He met Patrick McLamey, a distinguished architect and CEO of HOK. At the time, Patrick was looking to professionalize a community called Building Smart. The group had developed a methodology for improving the design and construction of built assets and produce the Industry Foundation Classes, or IFC standard. This standard helps businesses and individuals exchange information about a project or an asset in a uniform, standardised way to avoid waste, inefficiency 
and any single provider dominating the market. Building Smart had already been chartered as a UK nonprofit uh, limited company uh, from our early, earliest days. So we had some UK presence. It just wasn't much. And so we started a search and our headhunter said, this is the most difficult search I've ever had. You're asking me to find an executive for an organization that has no structure and no staff and no business plan and no strategy. <laughs> they were able to find two candidates, one of whom was Richard Petrie. When we had the interview with Richard, I think we split up in different groups. First, we had questions for him. And then the uh, the whole thing turned around and he started to raise questions for us. <laughs> and he brought up. He brought up very good questions, yeah. and I think already in this interview, you started to understand where we are in Building Smart and probably what has to be done uh, with Building Smart. After this interview, I was not sure whether he would come with, uh, with us or not. Despite some initial uncertainty, this was another challenge Richard relished. He began working on creating Building Smart International and hatched a plan to finance himself, future staff, and the ongoing operations of the business. However, there was no tangible product to sell. To move forward, he had to rely on a vision that would inspire organizations to see the prospect of a better future for the building industry. I started out with what's wrong with architecture and how can we fix it? The end of my journey is what's wrong with the building industry and how can we fix that? So it's a broader view of what's going on out there. And uh, he had this ability to, I call it lateral thinking. He could look at a problem and listen to people's description of the problem and ask the right questions to get a bigger idea about it, a broader idea. The early days were challenging, but a few leading organizations recognized the opportunity and pledged their financial support to Richard. He presented his plan to Patrick, and the vision was set for how the global construction industry could work in a more collaborative and streamlined way. It was a relatively lonely start, with Richard relying on regular calls with Patrick and other experienced members of the community to help him along his way. So when he first came on board, he gathered the old timers, me included, in different uh, locations or facilitated some meetings. And what he did was he, he just got us to talk and he listened and he learned and he observed and he made his own conclusions. He created a vision. He saw the need of professionalizing the whole thing, of course, having staff. And uh, and yeah, we had many, many good. Um, oh, I miss him. We had many, many good conversations. He made a great impression in terms of how he approached things, how he managed to see how we communicated, what we communicated, and uh, also where there was kind of let's say, uh, differences in opinions. And he managed to capture that quite well, uh, I would say. So, yeah, he was a great friend, but I really miss him. I realized how difficult it will be for him to achieve that goal because uh, Richard came from a traditional company. He used to have a traditional job in in a big company. And uh, to create a new body from scratch, in building smart, I said to myself, it will be very difficult for him. It, he is really courageous to undertake that. And the second time I, I, I saw him was in, in, in Beijing, I guess, six months after, and he was perfect. It was obvious that he handled the wheel, definitely. Some of the projects and groups or rooms as they've known within BSI, began to grow and develop. Traditional work streams diversified into infrastructure domains such as road, rail and ports and waterways. These important developments began to shape what Building Smart could be. Moreover, the organisation became truly global behind the international reach and diversity of these infrastructure projects. Richard was also keen to develop the chapter network. These are regional, in-country hubs that localise and encourage work to be done in that market. I think the most important thing what, well, he did a lot of important things, but probably the most important thing what he did is to build up this international community because um, the chapters, 
they are so differently and they are also on the on the level of the professionalization they are so different that this chapter community was not able to generate enough money to make a strong international organization and i think also many chapters really were not interested into this because they found they are so important and there should be nothing other important beside them <laughs> and of course um, you need somebody who can afford to think about this 24 hours a day let's say to be a little bit rude to the chapters but what richard was in the beginning and said now i build up this own membership structure and, and and this international membership to make a little peace with the chapters to give them a bonus if the company comes from the country with this strategy he was able to build up the professional level which we have today chapters also became the guarantors for bsi as their parent body bsi developed a new governance framework including a board scheduled yearly council meetings a strategic advisory council and international summits which were initiated and delivered in countries. My memory of Richard is that he was an Indian and an English gentleman, having warmly humanity, and I remember him welcoming me as a friend at the board meeting. After joining SAC, I have attended all the summit meeting and the board meeting and worked with him all over the world. At the dinner of the summit meeting held in Jeju, uh, South Korea, the topics of candidate country of the next summit came up. As a representative of Japan, I expressed my intention to host in Tokyo. And with Richard's support, the Tokyo summit was held in October 2018. Up until that time, The summit had been generally attended by about 300 people. But from the Tokyo summit, the presence of BSI suddenly increased with the participation of about 1,000 people. And at the same time, the number of participants in the construction industry increased. During the Tokyo summit meeting, I joined Tokyo sightseeing tour with Richard. We went together to Asakusa, a place full of Japanese history, and I remember we guided them the Barrier Stadium for the 2020 Olympic Games. Richard knew that I was a whiskey lover, so he gave me a nice bottle of Scotch whiskey as a souvenir, and I gave back the famous Japanese whiskey Hibiki to him. These summits came from humble beginnings of around 100 attendees, and the last in-person event before COVID drew over 1,600 attendees, with over 40,000 people watching online. This success never changed Richard. He remained level-headed and approachable to everyone in the community. His ability to interact with anyone, even through language barriers, was something Richard could do easily. His exuberant and unique laugh would often cut through the discomfort of challenging meetings and his ability to make anyone at the table feel part of his mission undoubtedly contributed to his success. Over time, Richard was positioned to hire staff to support the growing demands of the organisation. An operations director, a marketing director, a technical director, and shortly before his passing, the final piece was a compliance director. And this completed his original plan. His planning and foresight was impressive. Richard had already begun to build a team to support and execute his vision of what Building Smart could become, and this was to enable the full benefits of digital ways of working in the built asset industry. Now, after laying the foundation, the role of CEO is ready-made for a successor, because Richard, with a sound, logical plan, delivered everything he'd set out to accomplish. He knew his strategy had been fulfilled. He was really proud of that. And one of the last conversations I had with him before he knew he was poorly was he was saying... You know, because he was hoping to retire. And this is the tragedy of the whole thing. He was hoping to retire, you know, probably move on to a more of an oversight role with Building Smart. I don't think he had any intention of leaving the Building Smart community, but he was hoping to retire. And he was also hoping to spend more time doing outreach, you know, with potential members of Building Smart and bringing them in. So, yeah, he knew he had fulfilled the initial strategy and he was looking forward to the next phase, which was 
making changes to the world using the outputs that Building Smart was doing. Alongside this passion for his career and family, Richard was an adventurer at heart. He climbed mountains until Jane objected, encouraged him to consider his responsibility as a father. He sailed, skied and cycled. He even had the opportunity to sail the final leg of the 2018 Clipper race from New York to Liverpool with his son Michael. He asserted to everyone that it would be the only time he would sail the Atlantic. But just last November, he was drawn back to crew a friend's yacht for the ARC rally from Gran Canaria to St Lucia. In all that he did, Richard had a plan and inspired others with his leadership. He encouraged everyone to follow the plan with confidence. Even when faced with inoperable and untreatable cancer of the esophagus, he set his affairs in order. With only three weeks from diagnosis to his untimely passing, he had a plan. He shared the clear, logical plan with his family, and after his death on the 17th of April 2022, they are following it with clear confidence. He's one of the people in my life, I'm just thinking about this, one of the finest men or people I've ever had the privilege to know. Just a great guy, filled with positive energy and thoughts and boundless enthusiasm. And he could make friends with the person that had the most sour disposition and put a smile on their face. Richard Petrie is remembered by his friends, family and colleagues for his generosity, his honesty, love of life and a laugh that will be missed by all.